Hi, I'm Dan Warfield, founder of Managing Digital. Today, I'm talking to Mark Bodman, product manager for the ServiceNow CMDB. Mark was previously the CSDM product manager, and he knows all there is to know about that. You may have seen some of his ServiceNow videos on CSDM. There are a lot of them. I recommend them. But there's another angle on that, which is why we did this video. Mark and I have worked together in architecture for almost 10 years. We're now both very active developing new content for the IT for IT standard of the Open Group. I asked Mark to talk to me for this video because I'm training IT for OT, and ITSM experts are often the ones who have the most trouble understanding the IT for IT model, even though IT for IT's footprints are all over the CSDM. I learned some lessons in our talk that will feed right into my training and consulting work and I hope it helps you as well. Let's dive in and talk to Mark about how the CSDM model and the IT for IT model map to each other, how they're the same, and how they're different. Until we had our discussion the other day, I didn't really understand that the, the boxes on the CSDM represented something besides software or descriptions of software. I didn't realize there were teams in there. Yes. Um, yes, there's a lot more there. It's pretty dense if you think about it in terms of what we pack into it. And the data model itself is is not a normal like a TOGAF viewpoint, right? I mean, it doesn't match no. any, any single framework that you're kind of used to. When I present this to folks, it can be overwhelming for most audiences. If you're not an architect, if you can't really read a, a diagram, it, it becomes a bit overwhelming. I start with like the personas on the outskirts. These are the personas that own or and work with this information in each of these domains. If you've got a room full of folks in their different parts of the organization, they can usually find something that they understand, but the other stuff they may not understand. These terms service owner are, are right out of ITIL, aren't they? For the most part, yeah. A service owner owns that particular service and its delivery to consumers, whoever that consumer is. In this case, each of the each of these two bottom areas, they they're dealing with technical services. Right. Um, and over here, these are more like business services, but we don't say that today here. Um, you'll see business services here, but also products sold here. We'll get into that in a minute. But all right, all right. These, these are like the last mile of delivery outside the technical organization that builds up the layers of the technology. And these are these are the the classic CMDB CIs which make up what what we manage in a typical organization to represent the physical entities uh, or, or in cloud, right? The resources that are being managed and used and how they're interrelated. Okay. So so these bottom two domains deal with what I would call the classic operational management concerns and the technology services that make up those those uh, those layers, those technologies. These personas are also stratified on the left-hand side. Delivery is purely work to be done. So there's no connection to what we're actually pertaining to. The teams that own and manage things, there's no specific tie. That's just work to be done. Like, let's say, analysis work, planning work that has no tie to what we already have in the data center. Does that include These, putting blade servers in a rack, things like that? No, because a blade server in a rack would tie to an infrastructure management team, which has a service related to the blade server. These are technology services that are not going to be represented by a CI. That's right. There's no CI that would tie out that work to the team that's doing that work. Right? So what labor. about a, 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 I need to do some network design? Is that the kind of thing that goes there? Uh, no, that would come into the infrastructure team as well. Uh, there's a different technical service for each of those teams, and they would have uh, an offering, which let's, which would be network okay. management. So the network would still be a... So what would be a pure technology service that doesn't relate to a CI, but that... that I'm yeah, I, so plan the next data center move, or we, we could do like an analysis request to find all of the end-of-life technologies in the environment that still relates to ci's doesn't it yeah but it's it's not a single technical service it's more broader analysis and work to be done that's not tied to a specific technical service but i what i've learned about this talking to you is that 
this model is built up from how people actually organize themselves. Yes. So these categories are not completely clearly defined, but they're recognizable to your, your customers as different different service buckets that are that's that's right. Okay. And and we have team assignments at the technical service and the offering level. So if if I, for example, work for a big company and I own the network team, I may have five sub teams and each of the five sub teams manages networks for a specific region or building, as an example. So okay. I, I would have five offerings under my one network service and each team has their scope of network gear and building assignments based on where that network gear might be. So and, this and the, make... the technical service offering is a description of something you can ask that team to do. That's right. And it's also the place where we hold them accountable for their deliverables. Availability metrics, for example, if the network gear goes down, what we have is something called outage records. We track outage records on yeah. that network gear. And if it's down for a period of time, we aggregate those metrics up to that offering. And then underneath that offering, we calculate availability for everything associated to it. So in, in IT for IT, that offering would describe one of the kinds of things we would call a digital product, which, yes. would, in, which would include in the product definition, things like service levels. That's and, right. And so when you are describing that offering at the point where somebody asks you to do something, you would go back to your service template and then say, well, in order to deliver this instance, I need to make sure that these monitors are in place to, to monitor the things I've promised. Right. That's right. That's so, right. Um, uh, now those aren't in this picture. No, but, but that's implied. Okay. That's the assumption. Yeah. That we, we don't really have what I would call a lot of the, the nuts and bolts capabilities highlighted here. This is more aligned to the key primary elements that tie the people to the things they're doing. Um, but if, if how, I was, if consumed. I was a service now customer using this model, yeah, as part of defining a technical service offering, I would define the service levels that go with it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, those and are other typically... other the contract, whatever the contract is, whatever the yeah, we uh, generically call that a like commitments. There's a a commitment section in the offering, and under that commitment section, we can define a plethora of commitments. But you now your typical commitments in IT are SLA, OLA, and then XL, and then XLA, XLA. <laughs> yeah, that's coming. <laughs> there's there's um net you know net promoter scores you know all kinds of metrics we can add. And so I'm actually going to be doing a video with one of my colleagues to outline what's the top 10 metrics you put in a service. Cause that, okay. that cause folks ask, right. Availability happens to be one of the top ones, but there's, there's more. The, the other thing about that offering is it ties back to what we call the request catalog item. You can interact with the service through a request process of some sort. So whatever, whatever makes sense, you know, for networking, it may be, reporting an outage or requesting network support because I can't get something to work. Uh, so the, the catalog is a self-service portal for any technology consumers to interact with the system and the team associated with the, the particular uh, service that's, that's going on. Okay, so if I want to map this back to IT for IT, mm -hmm. we're talking about the uh, rather confusingly named release value stream. The service offering has to get represented by the catalog manager in a way that's consumable. That's right. That's so right. There, those are two different things. The catalog item is not the same thing as the service offering. Absolutely. And, and when, but when you define the service offering, it'll ask you what catalog item is it part of. And on our platform, the, the catalog items are a separate product area, but you have to set that up and then you can link the two, right? Here's how I expose it to my users. Here's how I define the actual offering and all the SLA cost and things like that. So, with it. so I might have a catalog item that says I would like a, a development server, which is going to be a LAMP stack and it's going to have this memory yep. and this storage and that, that would break down into different technical service offerings that need to be invoked to deliver that server. Is that right? Absolutely. So think about this guy, you know, would interact with the catalog and build a shopping cart of stuff you need to do, to do work right? or deploy a new, a new environment, new system. 
Uh, and, and I know I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but that's where the teams comes in. They're, they're the primary consumer that need the compute and would want the technical service to be established. So kind of a, a, a technology team consuming technology as a, as a building block, you know, in EA terms. And in order to build something um, the okay. different that they're working on. That all makes sense. Yeah. And then well, let me, let me, go further down that rabbit hole a little bit and say, what if my consumer of that technology catalog item is a business application that requires a technology stack to operate? Is there a subscription of that business product owner to that? Or how does that work? Yeah, so we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, for the most part, technology services don't have a subscription need. And, and the reason for that is because if I'm ordering a server, and I'm putting it into a application I'm building, I go away. I, I, you know, me individually, I, as a person will, will move on to do something else later on. So we don't track subscribers as people in the context of the, the, the process to, to manage long-term. Where, where, where we start capturing context is if I order a server, it's part of, a larger application design and that's what's captured in this app service it's a horrible name because it in my mind it's an application stack or system that represents many individual parts that are configured to work together a database server app server a front end server maybe a, an app in the phone that i'm using okay. um, to deploy so my development server is yes. a technical service managed by the application service owner Yes and no. So, so it is the application service owner that needs these individual parts after they're delivered, whatever they are. And they're the ones that are ultimately responsible as the user of that. And, and the guys that are provisioning servers, they don't know exactly how it's going to be used, right? They just give you a server. Good luck. <laughs> you know, I'll keep it up and running and patched and all the LAOLA things that they do for a server. Would my development server with various stack components and maybe some software on it would that be a thing i could order from the catalog and uh, yeah does, does that map to one of those three kinds of technical service offerings that would also say on a development server configurable uh, in these ways absolutely because there's a different well, what, cost we have cost and price in there and we expose that to the users that might be a showback or a chargeback function in this model if i have a catalog item called development server and mm -hmm. it has configurations and prices and service levels. Yeah. Which of these which of these service offering boxes would that be? The application service or the technology service? For just the server itself would be just a uh, technology service down here. Think about the teams responsible. They don't know what the application is. They they're gonna give you the server, they're gonna give you a login, credentials, whatever. They're gonna set that up for you. But beyond that, they're not responsible. Usually, this is a typical scenario for what's running on it. They're just responsible for keeping the server infrastructure going, regardless of what's running on it. Standard template for configuring a server, is that a technology service owner offering or an application yes. service offering? Yes, the server itself, any physical resources, think of any physical resources falls into the bucket of, a te of, of this level of the, of the infrastructure. So if it's, I had something in my in my catalog item that said I want a server that is uh, that has a specific sort of application on it, like a BI app or an Oracle database, how does that get structured mm -hmm. here? Yeah, so that's why we have two tiers here. This is where if it's a database, we consider that an application or platform, which is more than just the infrastructure. You have the application running on it and let's say a database server and storage allocated to it all integrated and running as a whole. And as a database user, you may not touch any of the individual parts. You just get a schema and you go into the schema to find the data that you want to store. The app service as a whole is a logical construct, which basically ties all of the individual physical constructs down here together. In, and in the CMDB, you see this. Those dependencies are illustrated between these physical entities the network devices used, the load balancers, the storage units that are used if it's mm -hmm. external. All of those individual dependencies are mapped in one app service, which is an instance of a database or an application as a whole. You see where I'm trying to go with my question. So if I'm, if I'm in the business, 
I've been in a position where I wanted to stand up a Tableau server, for example. Tableau is an application. You buy it from people. You install it on a, well, at the time, you installed it in an Oracle yes. database. Mm -hmm. And then the user needed an Oracle runtime on their laptop in order to make use of it. But as the business person, I don't want, I don't care about all the details in that orange no. box. No, no, so no. So where is, where is the catalog for that? Is that a different catalog? Yeah. So, so how, do, how does that all link, on, link up? How does that all yeah, link on, up? The, on the left-hand side, think of these are all building blocks. I'm building something. If the business is going to use Tableau, so my wife actually works in HR and she's got a database instance. She's not in the IT department at all, right? She's in right. HR. But she still uses a, a an instance of a database because she does all this analysis of, of data and she needs to bring it out. In that case, it is a business service. The main difference between this is that we have an internal consumer that we're tracking and that internal consumer is using the request catalog and we're tracking who that is and that who that, that consumer is, is a specific user or, or somebody on a team or in a group of users who, who we're managing. Okay, and the catalog items are made up of business offerings. Yes, business service offerings. There's a symmetry. The business service and offering here is symmetrical to the technical service and the technical service offering over on the on the left hand side. The only difference, really, is is whether we're tracking a subscriber to a an individual, a person in the business, versus in this case, building blocks. These are peer components the individual will go away. The only context you have for these components is the app service and who consumes that, if that makes sense. So the app service, from the point of view of the business application, represents all of these other things in the orange box. That's right. Yeah, it's our logical way of constructing those. In version five of CSDM, we have also are adding API because oh, they're, yeah. they're integrated. So now let's say I own the database and somebody else is building an app and application um, that calls to the database, I can describe how they are related to those APIs. So the build box at the left, they're interested in, certainly interested in APIs and application services. That's right. But maybe not that interested usually in anything else in the orange box. Correct. When you construct this catalog, there's going to be different services that you want to put in that catalog. And over time, you might want to take away ordering raw infrastructure and building just apps and platforms that people then access. It's a way of raising the building blocks so you're okay. not you know, selling so screws and bolts, right? <laughs> development team is sometimes a technology consumer, but usually catalog items they would be interested in would be aggregations of smaller things that they wouldn't be interested in. Yeah, yeah. And it, it depends on what they're building and, and, and the level of decomposition of those technical services. But, you know, designing that portfolio, we've seen people move away from managing infrastructure altogether and just basically saying, here, you know, go to the cloud provider and order resources. There. I've been in environments where software development managers were supposed to specify things in the data center. Yeah. <laughs> And, yeah, those uh, are the old days, though. Those, and, uh, it, well, I'm really old, so I, I understand yeah. that. But, it's the standardization of those requests so that people aren't specifying that level of detail anymore. So that makes sense. So the things that are of interest to me as a developer are the request catalog item, the, the things in the catalog. They are the APIs and something about the application services, because now am I... Mm -hmm creating those. I'm creating those application services. So I'm very interested in the details of that and how they're structured, Yeah, but but not necessarily in the stack underneath them. Nope. You, you just need what we call a URL entry point in our data model in, in ServiceNow, which is the access. It's like, this is the URL I use, and these are the credentials I use to access those resources. When people are trying to understand this, which part of this diagram is the one that they have the most trouble with? Is it the orange box? It varies. It's highly varied. It, it, and it stems out of the fact that we have a very specific set of use cases for technical services that are different than the business services here and, and managing who those consumers are. And, and also separation out of the app service. These, there's three different types of services depicted from left to right here on the bottom. Historically, we didn't have CSDM. There was no guidance on this. 
And what people defined as a service was either super generic, everything is one table, but it meant something wildly different. And now they're trying to figure out, okay, you, there are different use cases for these and different reasons to manage them differently. Different so you want to now we're making our way to your digital product portfolios. Where do they fit on this picture? The portfolios are aligned to these three key elements. The fourth one, which is the manufacturing, we don't have this illustrated here, but the first is the technology consumer and all of the tech, all of these, right? These are the, so what, that's, what the, that's the, the foundational. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, the sec the next portfolio is this internal customer. These are employees. So the right. business service and internal customers, I need to know who the employees are that are going to be impacted if it fails or who's who's requesting. You know, you have to have a, an employee identity. The B to the B2B to C, however, um, this is new in CSDM version five. And this is where we identify external customers, the account. What is my product sold? What is the digital product sold to external customers? And how are they requesting support for what we've sold them? So and then over, the, on, over on the right of the green box, you have a thing called enterprise portfolio. A portfolio yes. of what? So this is how we are proposing that we capture the business service currently and the technical services in these two portfolios. So there's two portfolios currently depicted here. The the other the third one would be this one, which we that we don't have defined here in in this particular diagram, but that would be my a, a suggested change. That's why this is still draft. And then the fourth one are all the tools to make this work. <laughs> it's the manufacturing and, and stuff that you don't necessarily see, but it's assembling and delivering these elements, like element managers that are provisioning the resources. Okay, here. that makes sense now, except yeah. right at the top of this picture in the blue box, I've got another thing called a portfolio. What is that? We have about seven different types of portfolios on our platform today. We have a project portfolio, app portfolio, service portfolio, technology portfolio. So we, we've got about seven key portfolio constructs where there's a hierarchy of things. Mm -hmm. You can think of your catalog items as creating a portfolio of catalog items too. We're trying to consolidate that down into a single portfolio construct and enterprise portfolios is sort of that construct. This portfolio up here is what I call the personal portfolio that individuals are looking at, which they are responsible for, which may cut across an enterprise portfolio. So as we look at some of the work we're doing on the IT for IT side, the enterprise portfolios would tie out to the four that we're talking about, the three currently in version three of IT for IT, and then the fourth one for the manufacturing elements that we're, we're talking about adding. The only other thing on here that isn't immediately obvious to me is what does CDM stand for? This is configuration data manager. What we're doing is that a classic configuration management database, it's not called out here, right? Configuration items, these are managed through policies and you review them periodically. There's there's level of governance applied to the CMDB because you can't willy nilly have people changing your your environment without going through a change management process, as an example. Okay, and getting approved. So does that map to ITIL change management? Yes, and ITIL change management is the transition between something in that build team that they they say, oh, it's ready to b deploy. They characterize and describe the change. They put the, the packages together and then some, but something, somebody pushes a button at some point and it, it gets deployed. So all that transition that happens in these lines is governed in a, a well-formed operation. So this uh, CDM is, is a combination of policies and law Pol and, yeah, and so, decision, so decision records or decision trees or workflows or things like that. Sort of. What we're doing is shifting some of our policy checks to pre-deployment, and that is to say, all right, you're going to be shipping out an artifact that you built. Have you tested it? There's a level of policy checks and governance that come in. We want to automate it in the development space and, and ensure they happen so that if there is an issue downstream, if operations does find a problem, it can come back to the component that was delivered and what policy checks were applied. Like, do we check this for, for vulnerabilities? 
And no, we didn't. <laughs> okay, well, we got to fix that so we don't deploy, you know, known vulnerable code. Then if I take a step back from that, I know what all the boxes mean. ServiceNow isn't really known as a development platform. So some of these things that we're talking about in the red box are, I think a lot of that is new territory or, or, or even places where ServiceNow doesn't play at the moment. We're not big players there. There's other bigger players in those environments, right? For development tools, absolutely. What we have built is more or less the instrumentation and visibility of what's going on in those tools. Two key elements we tie into. One is the business application up here. It's like if a team is going to build an app, we, we, we kind of start off with the, a design element, which we characterize. So we can say, oh, this team is working on this app, as an right. example. And then we can also tie into, oh, what is the team deploying on the operations side? So this logical application service helps to characterize, oh, this app is creating a, uh, you know, an update to an application on a server that is part of that larger app service. So this red box supports the three guys down the left of the orange box. Yes. Uh, in the work that they're doing because they aren't really people who traditionally would use you know, GitLab or something to organize their work. No, never, never, yes. Um, but probably used a lot less by people who are all tooled up with all the development tool chain, DevOps tools and things like that. It's, it's a bit of a, a challenge because there's so much that we can do, right, in the platform. You get lost in the weeds, <laughs> It's like you, you, an individual doing a job can find their place here, but then, the, you know, you have to talk to 50 people to, to tell the whole story because everybody in a large org is doing a different job. And well, using now, different now you're tools. in the architecture problem space of yes. being able to talk to all the people. I, I can remember projects I've done where I needed like 20 different specialists. Yes. To, there were like an elephant with 20 legs and each of them knew about one of the legs. And my yes. job was to see all of them. So tell well, that's, me that, that's it. Yeah, I now have a much better understanding of where you're coming from on this, uh, yeah. the things we're working on in the open group forums. So this is one way of looking at this space, and it's got a lot of work behind it and a lot of client interaction by your team. How different or compatible is it with other things in the environment, either direct competitors to ServiceNow or just other things that people are doing? I asked one of your colleagues earlier today, if I'm the product manager for, you know, name your big uh, vertical app that people like to use, uh, do I need to design my product technology structure so that it maps nicely into these categories? And, and her answer was, well, yes, if, if you want to run, manage it with ServiceNow. Yeah. It's what, do you do, large, what do you do with that? Largely, yes. The CSDM, the, the framework itself, the guidance itself has kind of taken over. Uh, it's, it's grown into a, as into a life of its own. And what do I mean by that? Every day I get multiple requests from, you know, internal people, customers, vendors, partners that state we are trying to become quote unquote CSDM compliant. And, and what that means is exactly what you stated there, Dan. They want to map whatever they're doing to the constructs that we describe in CSDM. For example, if we're integrating with another tool of some sort, does it integrate up here in the build area? It's a, if, if it does, it's probably a dev tool. But if the dev tool also has some operational components, well, we have to also consider all of this down here. <laughs> and then we have to tie out to the to the technology owners right of those components when we're talking to somebody that's trying to integrate or try to work with one area it it quickly spiders into other areas of this model in order to uh, assure that we're covering all the right bases a lot of the internal conversations we have is working out if we are integrating with another tools chain or somebody's coming over from another tool set where, where does that data land? How does it integrate? How does it show up in the ServiceNow ecosystem of products, all these products in the data model itself? So I'm, I'm going to draw something on here now, if I can. Now that I understand that uh, these things here are teams and people, Yep. Th these are descriptions of services that you can order. Yep. Uh, then that is something that gets organized by the 
if, if, it, if you're in your customer context, that's actually organized by your customer as how they structure their work. That's right. This stuff here, and probably some of these other things, the features, all of this design stuff, the business application, the description of the business offering is really more in the space of that third-party company that your customer is using. You have some integration points here. So how is this structured? If my third-party thing is going to be sitting in your CODB and I'm going to interact with it, then I need to build some bridges there, don't I, too? Absolutely. Yeah. The, the bridges are what's important here. It's bridging. And I would say the main value of CSDM is we bridged all of these personas on the on the on the left and the right into a single framework and single data model which we understand how they're connected or should be connected this is all really helpful for me to understand what's what's going on with this yeah and also to better understand what some of your colleagues ask me about when i'm doing it for it or togaf training both of those are different and they come at these concepts from a different starting point for the enterprise architect these are organizational units really they they largely <laughs> assigned around organization but that this comes yeah. down to some of the work we're doing right now and organizing these portfolios in a way that makes sense uh in, in the whole conway's law uh, uh, aspect of it as i think about how do i map these it for it concepts to this the, the people who i have the most problem explaining it for it to are people who are in deep ITSM and ITIL kinds of backgrounds. IT for IT just stands all of that on its head. <laughs> it's it's still it's still got its feet, but the feet are up in the air. Yeah. And they say, what are the feet doing up there? And what is this head about? And so we have to talk about that. And also from the enterprise architecture perspective, it wouldn't be fair to say enterprise architects don't care how the support teams are organized because they should. Mm. But but it's not the starting point. Yeah in, yeah. in any EA project, unless the EA project is, how do I organize the support teams? They're expected to interact with the support teams to make sure that whatever they're designing is supportable, but that's not their focus. The one the one thing that comes to mind, though, Dan, and, and if you're correlating this back to IT for IT in some way, this more closely maps to the data model and the, you know, the black dots on the IT for IT context. And, and, and what do I mean by that? The, you know, the, in the IT for IT parlance, this is the actual product instance. This, this is that physicality correlation to, to that data entity. Likewise, when we're talking about the, the technical service, this would be the digital product definition for platforms or infrastructure well, it, elements. One of, one of the portfolios would contain those as digital products, yes. Yes, so these would be types of digital products but in a specific portfolio construct, not right. you know, in another one, right? It's it's in the shared foundational element. But, but there um, are other digital product portfolios besides the one that contains those. Right. And most ITSM background people don't really deal with those very much. No, they, no not they, at all. They deal with them at the edges. So yes. what are all these CIs about when somebody well, in the business says something's broken? You need to try to connect those dots. I would say the core of ITSM is incident management. Let's just go right to that core. It, uh, we ship an incident management capability that almost every one of our customers uses. And out of the box, the, the incident form asks for three things to identify the problem. It asks for the service. So it, it asks for either the technical and or the, or the business service, right? You identify the service. Yeah. You identify the offering, so you ask for this thing. There's another field to say, oh, related to that service, which offering are you talking about? Is it a dev server or a production server, right, if you're coming in down that way? And the last thing it asks for is a CI, and these are the CIs from a classic CMDB point of view that identify a specific resource that you can go to and fix that's all very well if if you have that knowledge but in well it's an incident it, management you don't always know those things no no but here's the other magical element of this in the background most organizations do event management right so you're you're monitoring things and you're you're, you're kind of saying oh there's an yes, event yes okay so let's let's say somebody calls in and they say i'm having a problem with xyz thing i'm using 
in the background, event management's happening. And event management is going to say, oh, I, I detected this network here is no longer functioning. Yes. The event management will, will basically insert into our platform an, an alert. So the operations guys are going to get a little flash on their on their monitoring, saying network problem, network problem, network problem. But but, but that's yeah. what that's the issue, and this is what I try to explain to to people about IT for IT is that if you have followed that way of thinking about it, then when you get that alert, you know which business service is affected. Exactly, and that's however, the magic. however, however, most that's not the mainstream experience that people have in in incident management i wouldn't think no no but but it is where things come together on our platform and we can be proactive about this scenario and and what do i mean by that well if you if you have that incident management process or your event management we call it event management okay yes, or, yes. or more monitoring we've got an event this network gear is gone what we do is we as soon as that event is 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 identified we would create an incident so the incident would be created from that one device whatever that individual yes. resource has failed and there's something called calculate impacted services and what this does is it crawls through these related elements to identify if, 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 if that data exists well yeah and in best practices for most of our customers it exists now, I can't say that they have all the data, but they're adopting CSDM to do this today. This is okay. this is primary objective number one. <laughs> okay, and, so that's a, that's a lot of mapping if you're a large organization with a big legacy that's right. landscape. That's and a we, lot of and we al automate almost all of it, and we make it easy to define the service and connect the dots between what's manually defined and what's not defined by manual means. It's automated through discovery, for example. So we sell ITOM visibility, which is a dis a discovery tool, basically, to populate the individual CIs and how they're related to one another through these app services. I, so I, same... I, I understand all that. That doesn't work as well for the old thing that we wrote 20 years ago in our company. It works really yeah. well for things you bought that have signatures. Most customers right now are going to cloud. This works perfectly with cloud. And we use that tagging strategy to do this mapping. So it's automated and up to date based on anything changing in the environment, right? It's a it's an event-driven update to the CMDB so that data is captured no matter, you know. I, I did so, a video on on that just a, a couple of weeks ago and published how we do that for virtual management, right? VMware servers. In a mm -hmm. typical client, what percentage of incidents are resolvable like that down to being able to describe the actual business impact of the event? I would say most customers are getting to that point. Is it half of them? 80%? 40%? I would say 25% right now. 25%. Okay. And, and we've been at this for a long time, Dan. So CSDM is not new. Customers have been adopting this and filling in, you know, filling in the lines where they didn't exist before and, and, okay. with, and getting their data in the right place to fulfill these use cases. Now, the challenge is there are just many products that need to be deployed to do this well. If you want to do this by hand, there's a huge amount of labor. And I often say, I'll just pick on, on our discovery process. This costs money to keep up to date. You can either hire oh, an yeah, army yeah. of people. You can hire an army of people to try to keep it up to date manually, or you can buy the product we sell that does it automatically. Now, N neither that's of which is free. <laughs> so as well, no. But you yeah. do have to spend money. You have to continue to spend money to maintain it, which I hope is less than you were spending before on broken things that you didn't understand. Well, what's the cost of an outage where you don't know the impact? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I you get know it. what? What customers usually find is there's an outage and they take three days. It's like a roar room with three days of, of downtime because nobody knows the dependencies, right? And and you look at the business cost of being out, <laughs> down for three days. Oh, I'm remembering war rooms. I don't have to do that anymore now that I'm just I, well, a, yeah, but they still educator happen. and consultant. Oh, they do. I'm sure they do. God, I, but I've less been in, and less. We talk about culture in, uh, in IT management and a lot of Infrastructure and operations culture in, in a lot of places, there's a mix of people who want to follow regular processes and plan things. But there's also another big dimension in a traditional infrastructure and operations environment of hair on fire. In, in the worst organizations, people say, well, yeah, what they do there is 
they like firefighting. That's why they come to work. So if there aren't any fires, they start, they start some fires so they can put them out and be a hero. That kind of culture builds up in an IT infrastructure and operations world because it served a purpose for people to be like that. Those are the people who love the war room. Oh, we're going to stay up all night, eat pizza, and and dig into this problem, figure out the answer, and and all of that. And if, if that starts to go away as a thing you have to do, it seems to me that there will be people who feel like their reason for coming to work is, is starting to go away. When I use IT for IT as a lever to start going down the path you're talking about to reduce the amount of activity that leads to people running around with their hair on fire, yeah, among, among other things. Some of the people who were directly affected by that in, in the ITSM space in particular, that they just quit and went and found some other place where they could still be a fireman because we were taking that that roll away from them. Do you, do you see that in, in some of the customers you talk to? Is this, is this approach frighten people who like to be excited all the time? No, because every minute of downtime now affect a customer or, or productivity. I would say that concern, I don't see at all, Dan. I see the business leaders saying, we don't want firemen anymore. <laughs> you know, oh, that's no, I'm they, not, talk, they, I'm they not talking about that. I've never met the business leadership person who, yeah. who liked the hair on fire in the war rooms, but I've met yeah. lots of Lots of people who report to them who do. Yeah, it may be. I, I don't I don't meet with them often, so I don't I can't say that that's an impact. I would say that um, you know, those are those are folks that have PTSD afterwards after that career. I, I, and I, I, um, I think this I think this is going to be an issue as as we change the way that this kind of thing works. Yeah. For um, like HR managers. Who... Now, what what I will say, what what's interesting is a lot of times the folks that are in operations, they often own that CMDB as well. So they're the ones that are going to sponsor the automation to get the data in there. So they're not the the war room isn't three days now. It's what like you know thirty minutes because now I have the information and I've got monitoring to tell me what's failing specifically, and it and, and it ties out to something that you know us. Uh, the, that we do so 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 you're 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 changing more frequently so fires are being set more frequently but they're being put out more frequently if that makes any sense yes yes it does that, that's, yeah it's so it's a, it's a shift in the frequency it's a shift in smaller fires maybe there, there's a same impact but they're small and they're dealt with almost immediately because you have the information model and automation to figure it out or back out of change. Remember that, you know, it's like if, if a change was, it did, did get made. I, I know what it is. Thanks for watching. I hope you liked this. Our expert this week was my friend, Mark Bodman, CMDB product manager at ServiceNow and an expert on the ServiceNow CSDM. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and visit us at managingdigital.com. That's managingdigital.com. Thanks for watching. See you next time.